What is the main difference between the, uh, these viruses and kind of the the regular mill the regular the mill viruses? So your your regular Trojan horse or your your virus that goes through kind of emails and and sites that you get online. What's the what's the main difference that separates them? Do you think that they're equally disruptive and destructive, or um, is there some separation uh, not just in their code, but is the separation also in their intent? Um, what what's kind of the the major factors that um, put these in this new new category. So there are multiple layers of differences between the Marvel uh, families or Marvel categories we are talking about. One layer is the technical field. Uh, these Marvel use special techniques uh, to be undetected for a long time because it is their major uh, goal to uh, infiltrate into the system, uh, to corrupt uh, operation, and uh, to uh, steal information uh, from these. Uh, um, point of view, one difference is uh, the, the, the Viper, the malware that distracts uh, and remo uh, removes files or, or uh, makes physical destruction and so on, because at that step, uh, most likely you will be able to detect something and you see that the, the, the computer crashes and then an investigation will follow. And so uh, uh, it is evident that these uh, kind of steps will be detected. Uh, on the technical level, all malware is just a piece of code. So basically, um, it's almost the same, but still differ, differs a bit. And the difference is be, uh, because of this uh, different goal of the malware. Uh, if you make uh, a malware, regular malware, and you try to infect uh, millions of computers, uh, then you make it uh, in such a way that you maintain your network for a long time. You know that not just sooner or later, but within days, your operation will be uh, detected by someone and find uh, and somebody will find out the AV vendors will find out that there is a new botnet doing some nasty things like sending out spam or whatever. But your goal is to maintain uh, the system, uh, no matter no matter that uh, somebody already detected it. For this reason, for example, a botnet, a regular botnet, uses technique like peer-to-peer -peer networking because in the case of peer-to-peer -peer networking, it is much harder to find out who is operating the stuff or uh, just to shut down uh, uh, the so-called uh, command and control center because there is no command and control server possibly in a peer-to-peer -peer based botnet. In the other way, for Flame, Duke, and so on, they do not use this type of technique like peer-to-peer -peer networking. They have regular uh, command and control servers because they, the, the goal is totally different. Baldi, initially it was believed that the Flame, Dooku, and Stunet viruses were not connected. More recently, it has been shown that there is some connection between them. Can you yes. explain what that connection is and why it was so difficult to determine that in the beginning? What makes decrypting these viruses so difficult? So. Uh, decrypting these viruses is not so difficult in the general uh, mean. It is very hard to find it. For example, for Duku, we think that uh, it was used uh, for more than two years before we detected it. So the trick is not uh, what you do after you detect them, because they did not use uh, special uh, techniques to hide and uh, to survive such an investigation. But nobody investigated those de uh, devices or, or computers because there was no suspicion that something strange is happening on them. This is one step. Uh, then back to the major question, what is the uh, relation between these malware? For Duku, when we found it, uh, it was uh, evident that it is uh, so strikingly similar to Stuxnet that maybe the same group is behind that, uh, that or uh, somebody is trying to copycat the operation of Stuxnet. So the connection between Stuxnet and Duku was very evident. For Flame, and Gauss, it is the same. So if you see the code of Flame or you see the uh, structure of uh, Gauss, they are very, very similar. Of course, there are major differences, uh, but but based on the, the, the wall, so it's like if you go into a kitchen, you always know that it is a kitchen. And if you look for Flame, uh, look into Flame or Gauss, you see that it is made by the same uh, people, although pieces are different a bit. The interesting question was, what is the relationship between Flame and Stuxnet? Because uh, they are very, very similar uh, at the code level. So it was uh, really an interesting point when Kaspersky found that uh, one part of Flame, but only a small portion of the, the code, uh, is very similar to a, 
version of the uh, a module that is found in the uh, Stuxnet uh, malware, but only in a speci uh, specific version in the uh, 2009 uh, sample. And this gives the connection between the two malware families. But I really believe that the authors, the team that is behind the programming team behind the, these uh, malware, I mean, for Duku and Flame are different. So Duku and Stuxnet is one family, and Flame and Ghost is another one uh, made by a different folks. Um, and and Baldi, uh, you actually we just we actually just interviewed with uh, Kaspersky Labs. You actually named the Duku virus, right? Yes. What I read was that some of the files they were titled DQ. So, so, so I, I tell you the story. So. Uh, for naming the Duku, it began by uh, finding that, that there is something strange in a system and so on, and we were able to identify those pieces of code uh, that uh, causes the problem. So we identified a new malware. And when we started to analyze this on this sample, then at a certain point we, uh, we thought, okay, it is necessary to give some name for, for uh, this malware. And actually, I just uh, uh, one time I just sit uh, uh, at the computer and I, I saw that okay, here is this directory. It, it is DQ because I, uh, it contained I stored files uh, beginning with DQ in them. These files are uh, the log files of the keylogger. So basically, it contains keylog uh, material and uh, screenshots and so on. And they found that. Uh, a name like Dooku would be really interesting, and especially because in the Star Wars there is also a character with Dooku, but it is written in a different form, and it is short enough, and it is strange enough as well. So I, 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 I also checked the internet if there, was, uh, there were any other malware called Dooku uh, to be, uh, uh, of course, be, uh, to see that it is unique and nobody will uh, mistakenly uh, think that uh, this or that is the same. And um, there's been a lot of uh, research by um, one of them, like uh, Kaspersky Labs, but also the Crisis Lab, to reach out to the kind of the larger cyber community and kind of crowdsource, uh, disperse the information and try and get as many people working on it and um, decrypting and kind of uh, reverse engineering the, the viruses. What is that kind of, what's the effect that it's had on, on the understanding and um, of, the, of the viruses that have been out there? Um, and kind of what what has it what has it accomplished the the crowdsourcing what what have, what has what has crisis labs gained from it there are a lot of tiny parts in the the stories of duku stuxnet flame and so on uh, both in the operation both on the computers uh, uh, attacks or like forensics material and also in the code we have a lot of different pieces of code that nobody knows what is actually used why is it in the, the program and how to use that and so on uh, why, it, uh, why it is so hard to f uh, figure it out. It is not hard to figure it out, but if you don't have the incentive to check that specific part of the code, uh, then you take the more uh, interesting questions. So it is just a matter of, of, uh, of focus, what you are uh, thinking that uh, is important in the malware. And all the other pieces are uh, possibly not investigated by uh, anybody on the world possibly. So the, the thing is that the code is just so large that nobody knows exactly what is on, on the uh, small scale. So, I mean, we know the, the main goal of the malware and we know most of the, the goals of the modules, but uh, we don't know exactly every single piece of the malware. And uh, at the beginning, for example, for Duku, our investigation began to, to have an initial analysis. And this initial analysis can be a basis for for others' work, so to uh, enable others to go further and find out the, the clues what we still had when we finished this document. And the same is true for Flame. A Flame is just too large, megabytes of code, and therefore it is very, very hard to figure out uh, how it works uh, in, in parts. So the community is very large, but not coordinated. So nobody tells all the organizations what to check what to investigate and what type of code should they look for. And therefore, a lot of efforts were, were taken to find out clues on uh, all these malwares. But I'm pretty sure that if the people continue to work, then uh, some interesting facts will still be found on these malware. 
Interestingly, uh, we made the initial report on uh, Duku and also the technical, the, the most detailed technical uh, analysis and first analysis on uh, uh, flame, and that also causes problems because if we have such a detailed analysis, which is not perfect, as I mentioned, there are a lot of holes in that, but still, it, people do not have so much incentive to look for new pieces of uh, of clues and tricks in the code. Because alone one trick, investigating one trick can take, I don't know, a week. But if the result is not taken up by, by the press and not published uh, well, then uh, it is not a good motivation to even start the, the, the investigation. So there are a lot of interesting questions in this area, how to go forward and uh, how to make uh, advances in the handling of such threats. For example, it is totally unnecessary uh, to uh, have multiple people, so multiple groups uh, to look on the same code and check what it is doing. It would be okay, okay just uh, one single party makes these investigations, maybe somebody checks it, but then the others can focus on different uh, parts of the system. And also this kind of uh, uh, question about motivation is, is, is strange because for AV companies and uh, and laboratories, uh, the biggest achievement in this is they get publicity back. For governments, it is evident to, that they need to analyze these kind of threats to protect uh, their countries against similar threats or the actual threat. And so it is a very complicated story and very hard to uh, uh, say w what will happen in the next couple of years. But I am pretty sure that there will be changes in how we handle these type of uh, investigations. We've been talking about the complexity of these viruses. What security measures do you believe can be put in place to guard and protect against similar viruses in the future? And is there hope of reverse engineering to gain insight on how to protect, or will there be a continued growth in the capability and strength of these viruses? For, for most species or most parts of this type of viruses or malware, the code is not so complicated. It is possibly hard to analyze, but there are no such tricks that that, uh, that will give you hint for better protection and so on. So the major thing is that we want to understand how they work, and this is the, the, the goal, not, not for protecting against them. Of course, knowing about how they work and how the whole operation works helps us to find out new ways to protect our computers. Generally speaking, we have a lot of lot of uh, different tools that can be used for uh, protecting computers against similar threats. So basically, we also made some investigations, we will publish it later, that Duku or Flame could be identified by simple tools. So there are a lot of simple anti-rootkit or similar tools in the internet and if you use it well then then you are able to identify that one computer has suspicious activity or, or suspicious code on that. The thing is that the problem with that is that it needs professionals to analyze the results of these tools and continuous efforts to maintain the security of your system. On the other hand there are a lot of other security tools so of course uh, we can state that the antivirus industry did not work well against these kind of threats because the attackers especially tried to evade this kind of protections. They tested uh, their uh, product, their malware well, they had to be sure that no antivirus will find it in the wild. And that, that's, that's a bad point for the antivirus, but the antivirus programs work very well on other types of malware. But we have a lot of other uh, techniques to find out uh, problems in the system, like IDS and IPS systems, intrusion detection and prevention systems. Uh, they have two different types. The one, one is based, again, by signature-based uh, de detection. That means that uh, they try to find out problems, uh, what we already uh, knew or uh, already detected. And in that case, uh, again, the problem is that uh, such kind of zero-day malware attack or something like that uh, won't be detected by these uh, signatures. And of course, we have other spe special tools to uh, protect computers or systems against uh, these kind of threats. So firewalling, separation of the network, encrypting, ba making backups ag against wiping attacks, data loss or data leak protection systems, honeypots special computers there are so-called traps for for the attackers they do nothing or or they just collect information on your network and if they get hacked they alert Im immediately the administrators that there is something strange in inside your network uh, 
So there are a lot of already available tools to uh, make a good protection, but people or companies do not use it well because it takes a lot of effort and, and money and so on to use them well. And still there is a chance that uh, the attackers can uh, do something uh, nasty. So uh, it is uh, not so evident that we need new techniques, but of course there is a place for fi figuring out uh, uh, ways how to protect uh, our systems uh, in a better way. Going off of that, so there's been a lot of there, there's been a lot of speculations. These attacks aren't the coordinated efforts of um, hackers or single individuals. That that because of their sophistication and their their kind of um, level of destruction that it, it's someone who has a lot of funding and it's someone who has a uh, specific intent because of their because of what mm -hmm. these viruses are going after from the analysis of the code who do you think these viruses came from or do you think it's um, someone with serious funding or, or do, you, do you think it could possibly be just the, the a group of individuals just kind of getting together and uh, making these attacks or do you think that, that it's, it's someone with an intent and a, a purpose and, and, and serious backing of course, uh, to answer this question, it is not uh, not uh, for for a question for technical people. But uh, we are interested in uh, how this uh, war story evolved, and and of course we had some speculations and a lot of thinking about uh, what it can be. Uh, for Stuxnet, uh, first of all, we also raised the question for ourselves: What if somebody, an individual, made made this code or a private company? And there are proofs that it is not possible. For for example, most likely. Uh, the guys who made Stuxnet sh should have tested the code for a long time to be sure that it is uh, it runs perfectly and it can really destroy centrifuges. And for this, uh, most likely they had to buy uranium uh, centrifuges or, or obtain some uh, and and test their code on that. And most likely you are not able to go to the sh local shop and buy a uranium centrifuge uh, and uh, or even if you order something like that uh, with lots of money, uh, the intelligence agencies will surely uh, find it out that something strange is happening at that private company. So uh, this is the major uh, point why we think that uh, it should be some state behind it, uh, because otherwise, otherwise uh, these kind of big efforts would be detected by the government. For Flame, there is an interesting thing in the Windows update based uh, infection mechanism, and it is the special trick uh, how they uh, produced or created a, a fake certificate that looks like uh, uh, authentic for the computers and uh, makes it possible to send a Windows update like code for your computer and your computer thinks that it is authentic and comes from uh, Microsoft, but it is not, it is coming from the attackers. For Flame, the attackers were able to produce similar collision but with special restrictions, like they had to predict pieces of uh, information uh, put in the certificate, but not known at the current time. So when they created the collision, they had to predict exi uh, exactly what second or even at what millisecond uh, Microsoft will sign a specific code. And if, you, if it takes some one week for you to cre uh, create one collision attack and you cannot really predict this and you had to make it again and again, it takes a lot of effort to produce uh, such a fake certificate. The other possibility is that they had much more information, like much bigger computational capability, or they knew cryptographic uh, breakthroughs that, that makes this attack much uh, easier to do. So again, it's most likely only governmental groups uh, can obtain such an information on such a uh, capability and uh, not individuals and especially not uh, lonely hackers. For all these, you cannot really prove who is behind them. But uh, as I tell you the, by these examples, these uh, side informations give you the idea of what is happening. Once a virus has been released and begins to infect hosts, what are some of the first steps that institutions can take to halt the data hemorrhage? Is it simply unplugging an Ethernet cord and wiping the machine? What needs to be done in that, in, in, in the beginning? If you don't know you will be infected, of course you cannot decide or, or uh, figure out that uh, we, we have a huge problem and what to do now. So then you are already armed, let's say. The first step is precaution, what you have to do to avoid such infections. and. We don't know exactly how they infected uh, computers, I mean. For Stuxnet, we know that Stuxnet can propagate, but Duku possibly cannot. 
and therefore they had to use a special dropper to infect your computers. This dropper was, in that case, an email containing an attachment, a Word document that contained a, a special zero-day exploit by which uh, they could infect your computer. For Flame, we don't know exactly how the propagation mechanism to infection of, of the first, first computer works. We have information about this Windows update based mechanism, but there should be something else. And we don't know how it works for Gauss. And of course, these are not the only pieces of malware uh, that are used in targeted attacks. There are a lot of others, but not so interesting some, for some reasons uh, in that case, so they, they are not uh, compared to this directly, but all the targeted attacks uh, against uh, different industries like chemical industry or defense systems and so on, they also use these tricks like sending out uh, malware in attached uh, uh, documents and so on. So we don't know exactly how the first computers get infected in uh, companies. But we have ideas what it can be, and uh, the idea is that most of, uh, in the, of the cases they uh, they use the special emails attachments uh, containing special document get, that is formatted in, in such a way that uh, it can elaborate the problem of software what is on your computer. To be more specific, these are uh, attached files like PDF, Excel, Word documents, and so on. And when the PDF reader Word processor or Excel loads this document, and if there is some error in these programs, then uh, it can be used to attack your, uh, uh, infect your computer. So the first step is, of course, to uh, upgrade your system uh, and patch all the uh, uh, vulnerable software components on your computer, and then the attackers have no chance to, for example, use two years old exploits to infect your system. But what to do against those attacks when uh, the attack is really a zero day? That means that nobody uh, knows, even the uh, creator of the software, that there is a uh, security hole inside the, the specific software. In this case, you have still a chance, for example. You, you just open all the documents coming from untrusted sources on a separate computer that is not connected to your internal network. And what to do then? It is a hard question because if, if this computer gets infected, then maybe the, uh, the attackers can figure out the, the contents of other emails. But you can use special techniques like uh, recovering the state of this computer daily. And then for the, you limit the size of the attack because the attackers can only attack one computer and also the length of the attack because if you reinstall or re restore your state of the computer every day, then they have just one day to attack. I have to note that uh, in many cases of targeted attacks, the attackers remain on the victim computers or systems for weeks or even years. And that is the problem. This is why they call, the, some, some people call this kind of threat as APT, advanced persistent threat, because it is persistent. The attackers have long time uh, to figure out what is the important information in the targeted system. If you are able to uh, disable their capability to be there for a long time, then possibly they can still attack you and make uh, uh, problems, even destructions like uh, deleting computers, but at least does not uh, take uh, years and you have a chance that not all of your information will be taken. I think uh, it is very interesting question to see that everybody realized the importance of, of these kind of threats and uh, to be able to protect our assets and critical infrastructure and so on. So what is really good uh, that uh, up to now, it seems that these attacks did not create big losses for countries and especially not for Western countries, but everybody realized the, the importance of the protection and therefore there is a lot more focus on, on uh, protecting these assets. And I think uh, this also means that uh, people will have more resources to really protect uh, our infrastructures against uh, similar threats. That not only means money, that uh, people or, or, uh, or companies will have more money, for example, to buying new stuff, but also means that researchers will have more possibilities, funding possibilities uh, to uh, continue their efforts to make new types of protection or investigate the problems more deeply. Uh, it also means that people will try to uh, make their stuff perform better uh, in protections, to train these guys and so on. 
And also that means that what, what we talked about is that governmental agencies, uh, international organizations will, will start to thinking about how to think about how to handle these types of problems and what to do in the case of a cyber attack. And basically everybody will be more aware and the whole situation will be more clear.